Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Waynesburg Effect. I'm Ryan Schwertfiger here alongside our panelists, Mitchell Ross, and our special guest panelist, Tyler McCoy. Thanks for being with us, Tyler. Thank you for having me. If you haven't watched the show before, each panelist will bring up a topic that has an effect on the nation, the community, or even us as college students. Each panelist will get an opportunity to give their opinion on the issue at hand, and we may even engage in a friendly debate on the topic. We all have our own opinions, but we make sure that what we say is backed up with facts so that you, the viewer, can not only be more informed, but also capable to form your own opinions on how the topic we discuss affects you, your family, and your friends. You're watching The Waynesburg Effect. The Supreme Court lost a giant when Justice Antonin Scalia passed away at the age of 79 years old. I'm sure you were just as surprised as I was when the news broke, but while I did not know the Justice personally, I was very honored to meet him three years ago. Personally, as a conservative and as a strict constitutionalist myself, it was quite exciting and a really amazing opportunity that I and other members of Waynesburg Stover Center for Constitutional Studies and Moral Leadership had the chance to talk with Justice Scalia probe him with questions about his decisions, and hear his insight and advice for all of us. To be honest, he wasn't necessarily warm or extremely friendly in our short time with him, but he was blunt, honest, and open about sharing his opinion and what he thinks all of us should be doing and should be reading if we want this great republic we call the United States to not just succeed, but stay true to our founding principles and document. And while the nation mourns his death and reflects on the immense impact he had on and off the court, we also must see where the country heads now in filling his vacancy on the court. This alone has stirred up a political battle between the president and Congress, in addition to the candidates running for president, and it is likely to not end for several months at least. So definitely an issue and a topic we're continuing to hear about in the news, and it's probably not going to end anytime soon, probably going to be happening for at least several months. Mitch, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any personal opinions? I mean, I'm sure you've, I know you watched uh, the court a little bit, mm -hmm. but you know, what, kind of, what, what was your impression when you heard the news, and what did you, you think about Justice Scalia? Well, it's definitely a sad day when I heard the news, and reading up about the life and work so, of Justice Scalia, I, I really think this is a guy that you know, I can you know, think along the same lines with for a lot of his beliefs. You know, he's a very stout conservative, as I am, and he's known for being a guy that was very combative and argumentative, but at the same time, uh, you know, a thoughtful guy and can, you know, at least have conversations with, uh, with the other side. You know, th the best example of that would be uh, the fact that he had a close friendship with Justice Ruth Gator Ginsburg, who was the far left uh, on, the mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court. So uh, that, what's a, that's a great guy that can, you know, have his beliefs but also get along with the other side. And you know, ever since 1986, whenever Ronald Reagan him appointed him uh, to the court, he's worked day in and day out for over three decades uh, to be the best that he can be at his job. And that's a great example for everybody, no matter what area of life you are in. You know, and for me personally, this fact uh, is what I like. First Italian Supreme Court Justice. I have an Italian heritage myself, so I like that. And just the fact that he was very outspoken on very uh, you know, tough, controversial issues such as abortion, affirmative action, uh, homosexuality, uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and I agree with a lot of the things he did, but even if you didn't agree with him, you could still have good conversations with him, and that's what politics is about. So I, you know, I could go on and on with little things here and there, but overall, I think the example that we can get from Justice Scalia is one that, you know, while you may believe a certain way, you know, politics is about coming together and getting things done uh, for the good of, of, of the country or state, you know, depending on what government you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, and especially off kind of the point you said, he was very fiery in all of his decisions and dissents and even cases he agreed with. And he did, even though he was at odds with the more liberal members of the court, you know, we did see, you know, he went out to operas mm -hmm. with, uh, with one of the justices. He took Elena Kagan, Justice uh, Kagan, out, and they did a hunting trip together. Right. And I think it kind of shows how that dynamic worked, that he still could vehemently disagree with them, but at the same time also wanted to engage and get to know them. So I'm going to turn to you, Tyler, and just going to ask you, you know, as we're now being able to reflect on the entire career of Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court, are there any cases in particular that you kind of foresee being the ones that he's going to be remembered for or anything about his time on the court that really stands out to you and we'll be reading about in the history books? Yeah, well, often he was a member of the dissent, and he was known for his fiery dissents. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he's going to be remembered so much for 
um, as a, a as being on the on the winning side, but he's going to be remembered for his dissents and his conservative intellectualism. Uh, the origin his originalist interpretation of the Constitution is going to probably be um, what he's most remembered for. Uh, actually, Elena Kagan, uh, his fellow justice and former uh, dean of Harvard Law School, discussed how before Scalia, originalism really was not seen as a legitimate interpretation of the Constitution. And uh, ever since, uh, you know, after his time on the court, it's now uh, seen, um, seen so as, as being um, legitimate. And we see examples of that in the fact that many law schools around the country have now hired professors who uh, agree with the originalist uh, point of view when it comes to interpreting the Constitution. So that's probably, whether you agree with it or not, that's uh, his greatest uh, legacy, I believe. And it's what, uh, you know, we will be... Uh, we will be looking at in the future with more. Now, of course, we still have Clarence Thomas, who is a champion of religion, originalism as well. Um, so, you know, both of them together kind of have, have brought that back into the spotlight. So, yeah, so now with the loss of uh, Justice Scalia, I mean, there are a few people who you can deem as being conservative who are left, but that still leaves the problem of we have an empty seat. And a lot of the cases, especially with the way the Supreme Court has been going with, in terms of all the decisions, you know, it's likely we're going to have a lot of 4-4 decisions coming down the pipe uh, in the Supreme Court. And that set up the argument of now how are we going to try and replace Justice Scalia. On one hand, you have the Democrats who say that Obama's, uh, President Obama is the current president. He should get to nominate someone. He should have someone fill the role. On the other hand, you have the Republican candidates running for president and Mitch McConnell, uh, the Senate president. And he's essentially saying... No, we should, he shouldn't appoint anyone. This should be a decision that's left to whomever is the next president. So I'll start with you, Mitch. Who do you think you side with personally? I'll ask personally, and then as the way the law is, how do you think it should work? Oh, well, this is a particular issue that I honestly don't uh, know enough about to be able to make a, you know, a wise decision on this one. But I have looked at it a little bit in a recent poll that I saw um, talks about how you know it's another split issue you know like we need any more divisive issues uh, in today's day and age but uh, just from the current public I think it was a poll run by CBS 47 percent uh, side with the fact that Obama uh, President Obama should be the one deciding this 46 percent uh, of the country think that oh no wait we'll just wait till the to the next president I can kind of see a little bit from both sides but again I'm not uh, entirely uh, too sure uh, of the process right now, so uh, we'll, we'll see how, how it goes. Well, if you if you if you were the president of the United States, though, do you would you would you put someone forward to be nominated, or would I would you go from the perspective I mean, of I, they I would wait? put someone forward to nom be nominated, but does that mean he uh, you know it should be the one that ends up taking that spot? You know, that's yet to be seen. All right, and I'll ask you, uh, Tyler, what, what, what would you think? What is your personal opinion, and what do you think should happen? I side with President Obama, and I believe the law does too. It's his right to nominate someone. I would like him to nominate an Anthony Kennedy type candidate, kind of, kind of middle, uh, middle ground there, so we can everyone can kind of unite behind him. So, do you, do you think that such a person would get passed by the Senate? I'm not sure. The partisan uh, rancor in the Senate from both the Republicans and the Democrats may harm harm their chances, but they ought to give whoever he puts forth a fair shake. Well, we'll have to see what winds up happening, especially in these next few weeks. Obama is going to have to nominate someone soon, or at least he said he's going to, so we'll find out from there. But we'll find out more right after the break as we go to a story about the Super Bowl. Got a king? Go fish! In your face, in your face, in the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Lights, theatricality, and music. Some of the world's most successful artists have graced the stage at the NFL's premier event. Super Bowl 50 was no different. This year's performance was headlined by Coldplay with appearances from Beyonce and Bruno Mars. Like most years, it left people talking. But this time, it was not what they sang, but what they represented that caused such a stir. 
Beyonce's Super Bowl performance, which was complete with barrette-clad backup dancers in homage to the Black Panthers and Black Lives Matter movement, was attacked as outrageous by conservatives like former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Some even called for a boycott of the pop star. As for Coldplay, some say they represented the LGBT community in their performance and point to a number of different reasons as proof to that. Debate has raged as to if this was the proper outlet to show support of such controversial issues. So gentlemen, uh, first I'll just ask, Ryan, what was your reaction uh, to the news from the halftime show? Well, when I first watched it, uh, I'm not really a huge fan of any of the artists, so it was, for me it was like, oh, here they go, doing something really grand and probably somewhat stupid looking again. Uh, I didn't really see or kind of notice many of the different things that were brought up later until I read an article explaining why Beyonce dressed the way she did. You know, they held some sign, apparently. I didn't see any of that, or at least I probably wasn't too close paying attention. But afterward, I was, you know, when I, reading all the different assessments of what happened, I, I'm kind of torn, personally. Uh, on one hand, I'm, I think they could be better off spending their time going to the black community and, you know, having those, those organizations of Black Lives Matter, like, actually going to these African-American communities and trying to improve the community instead of blaming other people for their own problems. Uh, but I think another thing off of that is you also have to know when you have such a big stage like that, of course you want to use it as an opportunity to espouse something. The question is at what length do you go and how appropriate is it? And I think that's what the big debate is. Tyler, I'll ask you a similar question. Do you think this is the proper stage for musicians and artists to you know, basically promote a political message? Well, I think certainly uh, it was uh, their right in a way, too, whether I think it was a, a good decision, um, maybe not so much. Uh, I think it's promoting uh, division, and so even uh, if you agree that the Black Lives Matter movement has legitima legitimacy, I, I believe that this, uh, particular, this particular show maybe, or this venue and the way they, they portrayed it wasn't the right way to, uh, to go about doing that. And just to tag on to that question, it's just, you know, in my own mind, I was thinking of this uh, the other day. Do you think that, you know, some of that, you know, cold play, uh, you know, demonstrating towards the LGBT community, uh, is that, you think, because of the venue and being in San Francisco, a city uh, primarily known for, for that kind of movement? Do you think it has anything to do with it? Um, I don't think necessarily it has anything to do with it. I think they were, um, they were just doing, you know, what they wanted right. to do. And, um, you know, just because it was in San Francisco... Um, I don't think it affected, right. you know, affected it that much. The same people who were watching the Super Bowl any year were still watching the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. The same fans who would come any year, no matter where, no matter where it's held, uh, still came to watch it in person. So yeah, uh, Ryan recently, uh, a Tennessee sheriff uh, had shots fired at his house, and he had made the suggestion that it was an alleged incident that ris had arisen because of Beyonce's controversial halftime show. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard about that, but. Uh, that's kind of uh, an inter interesting thought that now we're seeing violence and in, in, uh, police in Tennessee are saying it's because of the halftime show. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I don't know all the facts behind the case, so I will refrain from saying it's, you know, it's, it's true or it's false. However, I think, you know, especially when we do see these things like that going on in America, we see something so broad that everyone's going to see it and people will maybe feel provoked to act. Uh, I think it, it kind of sets a bit of a message out as to like maybe this is something that's acceptable because everyone's seeing it, everyone's on the same page. And kind of like what I said earlier, I think, you know, if they want to do something for the black community and try and raise awareness of some of the issues, they can do that in a much different positive way than I think going via the violence route. I mean, I feel like if Martin Luther King was here today, he would very much frown upon what the Black Lives Matter movement stands for and what, they've, what they have been doing. And I think in one of the articles I read, they even said, you know, they made like an X on the field to signal a shout out to Malcolm X. And if you know anything about Malcolm X, that's, I don't think it's the kind of legacy that people in the civil rights movement want to have and leave. So I would recommend that, you know, if they still want to put that towards one of their causes, that's fantastic. I think it's a venue that obviously you can do that. But I think there's a much better, different way to do that that will affect more positive change. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great way to put it. Uh, definitely, Ryan. Uh, Tyler, another uh, uh, quick uh, thought on this. The NFL has blocked the airing of any uh, video being put out from the halftime show, claiming the organization has made the move on copyright grounds. But you think that's just to um, you know, make sure that this kind of controversy stops right where it's at? Yeah, I think it's probably they're trying to shut down the controversy. Uh, I'm not sure if they were expecting the controversy or... All right. But, you know, it's uh, maybe a legitimate-looking excuse for trying not to bring the negative 
the, the negative light on them, especially considering the NFL hasn't exactly been uh, highly esteemed these, uh, these past couple years. Yeah, certainly a lot of other issues uh, have arisen within their conduct uh, in the league. Uh, Ryan, uh, we saw another Black Lives Matter propaganda movement from the Grammy Awards the other day uh, with uh, Kendri, uh, Kendrick Lamar uh, having another uh, sort of Beyonce-esque performance. Uh, do you think that we're going to see more of these sort of events continue in, in the public limelight? I think so. I mean, again, when you have that opportunity, people are going to use it. And I think, you know, sometimes, depending on whatever side it is, whether you know, I'm more of a conservative or when you're on the more liberal side, you know, if you have that opportunity to be in front of all those people, of course you're going to want to take it and do something with it. But I think the real question is, is, is then what you're doing, is that going to actually cause the change that you want? Or is it just people kind of making grand statements uh, because they can? I, I would hope that instead of just doing things just to show off or so it's, so it's trending on Twitter, that they actually want to do things that will actually create positive change. Well, it certainly will be interesting to see how the discussion evolves over the next little while. In the middle of a heated political season, like you said, Ryan, a lot of times people take any opportunity they can uh, to tell people what their stance really is. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next here on The Waynesburg Effect, we'll dive a little bit further into politics. Stay tuned. Sweet pizza. What the? Hey, how about you try this banana? Key, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot better. If you be good to your body, it will be good to you. Make smart choices when selecting what you will eat. Visit ChooseMyPlate.gov for more information on the best foods to bring out the best you. The race for the White House is now well underway, with party primaries and caucuses almost every week until the end of the primary season. Polls show that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton continue to have the leads in their respective parties. The latest Real Clear Politics poll average has both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump with a 13-point lead over their nearest competitor. The most interesting poll that came out this week may be the Quinnipiac University poll, which shows Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton in a virtual tie nationwide. The real question now is, can Donald Trump be stopped and can Bernie Sanders rise to the top? And so I would just like to start with a general question. I would like to discuss both parties, but just to start, do you think Bernie Sanders has a real chance at stopping Hillary Clinton? I mean, I, I think he does have a chance. Uh, you know, what the percentages lie for that, I don't know really, but I think that it, you can't just count him out just because of how many young voters that he seems to have on his side right now. And, and I think that's something that, you know, I look at it, and of course, I've made note on the show several times, I'm a conservative, so I don't really agree with hardly anything that Bernie Sanders says or puts out. But at the same time, you know, People that, that do, it seems like they're just, they're uninformed. And I'm not saying that they can't have that opinion if they actually, you know, look it up, research it, and say, okay, I like what Bernie Sanders says because of, you know, A, B, or C. But they just like, oh, you know, he's going to get us free college or something like that. And they hold on to this one view, and they just, you know, don't look anywhere else because of that. Uh, but it's because of voters like that that maybe Bernie Sanders can stick around, uh, you know. Yes, I'm saying Bernie Sanders will stick around because of the uninformed voter. If that's offensive, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Do you uh, think he has a chance? Uh, I, think, I think there's a chance, especially with everything still going on with Hillary's emails. I mean, essentially, according to the Constitution, it says right there, you know, if she's indicted, she can't run for president, she can't seek any higher office, and then kapoof, who's left? Bernie Sanders. I mean, especially after Martin O'Malley dropped out with only getting 1% in Iowa. Rest in peace, Martin O'Malley in the campaign. Um, but I think, I, mean, I think we're kind of seeing the same thing we saw with Hillary and Obama. Everyone thought it was going to be Hillary Clinton in 2008, and then here comes this upstart candidate. No one really knows who he is, but he just galvanates attention in the country, gets the youth people out, and even though it was a long protracted battle, we led to, got to President Obama. 
I'm not sure if that exact same scenario will entirely play out for Bernie Sanders, but I think we're seeing something similar, especially in this go around. I mean, when we're seeing Donald Trump doing so well, people are looking for the outsider. They're looking for the direct person who's going to take leadership. And Republicans, or at least 32.5 percent on average, think that's Donald Trump. And on, on the Democrat side, people are starting to more and more warm up to Bernie Sanders. Yeah, kind of moving to the to the Republican Party with Trump. Of course, he lost in Iowa, which actually wasn't expected so much because the exit polls showed him showed him winning. Uh, but then, of course, he had his landslide victory in New Hampshire. Um, moving into the rest of the primary season, he has a pretty clear lead overall uh, in most states. Do you think there's any chance of any, and I'll take this to Mitch, do you think there's any chance of anyone stopping him at this point, or do you think he's got his momentum and he's going all the way to the convention? Well, I think there is definitely a chance, as in the Democratic side. I think there, uh, because there's several candidates like uh, Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio who still have a strong support uh, from their uh, side, I think that there is yeah. a chance that he could be stopped. But you are definitely right in saying that he's got a lot of momentum going right now. Uh, I think that uh, it was interesting to read out of the Washington Post uh, they said by Saturday night after South Carolina, uh, Trump is poised to have a gigantic lead uh, in, with, amongst the Republicans. I mean, of course, it's not insurmountable uh, by any means, as I'm saying. Uh, but there, if, if he wins South Carolina, I feel like questions will rise then uh, that, you know, hey, can he be beaten? And, and uh, you know, that's going to, the more he wins these primaries uh, as it goes on, uh, that question and the answer is going to be more clear. Yeah. Now, Ryan, there's also been talk uh, about, you know, the candidates, Governor John Kasich of Ohio, uh, former Governor Bush, or Governor Bush, formerly Governor of Florida, and then Senator Marco Rubio, uh, whether one of those three can kind of um, take up the torch for the establishment and take the nomination. Do you think there's any hope of an establishment candidate? Because what we're seeing is Trump on top and Cruz at second place generally. Do you think the establishment has already lost this nomination fight, or do you think maybe they, they have a chance of getting one of their guys in there? Uh, I don't know if I would say lost, and I'm sure if you ask John Kasich, I'm, I'm, he said this numerous times, he said, I hate when they put us into lanes of you know, who's a moderate, who's the liberal, who's the conservative, but I think it is going to wind up having to be Trump, uh, Trump, Cruz, and Rubio. Yeah. Um, and if you look at it, a lot of people were kind of saying, oh my gosh, you know, Trump's unstoppable, but it's like, well, if you look at Iowa, he got 24% of the vote. That means that 76% of Republicans don't want Donald Trump. They wanted someone else. You know, and if you take, you know, Kasich's polling on average at 6%, Carson at 6 Bush about 5 Put either of those towards Cruz or Rubio, and all of a sudden, nationwide, you have a contest or maybe even a lead. You can beat Donald Trump. And we saw how Donald Trump essentially went crazy after he didn't win Iowa. And then all of a sudden, look, I'm back on top. I'm number one because he won New Hampshire. Yeah, I think especially if you can show the vulnerability of Donald Trump, and in a way, I mean, even though it's been highly politicized, we're seeing that with now with the just uh, the death of Justice Scalia. Now, some people are kind of wondering, maybe you know, for really important issues, do we want someone like Donald Trump, or maybe they'll go to someone like Ted Cruz, who's still that anti-establishment, but at the same time, they trust him a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think uh, I definitely think that's a possibility now in the debate in Greenville uh, a few nights ago uh, Donald Trump kind of lost some of his seemed like he was losing his cool a bit uh, after he blamed in, in an indirect way blamed former president George W Bush on not protecting the United States during 9/11 and uh, he had some yelling some uh, yelling at other candidates do you think this is a sign of his weakness or do you think uh, do you think at this point he's proven that he can basically do or say anything and uh, he will uh, he'll keep going. I'll take this to Mitch. Well, he thinks he can do or say anything. I'm not yeah. really sure uh, if that's going to help him in the long run or hurt him, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we uh, I think we will see. Um, what do you think? Do you think he? he well, loses Bo Bush. Weekend? Both Bushes are pretty popular in South Carolina. Yeah. However, I'm not sure if that's going to be enough to get rid of Trump. But we'll have to see how it also plays out nationwide. Yeah, we will have to see how it plays out nationwide, and uh, it'll be interesting to see as we go forward, and especially as we hit Super Tuesday on March 2nd. So coming up on the Waynesburg Effect, we will have our uh, fun and lighthearted stories, so stay tuned. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean.
give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Welcome back to the Waynesburg Effect. We're going to conclude our show with our usual lighthearted and more fun topic. So I'll go first today, if you don't mind. A couple from Alabama thought that for Valentine's Day, they'd make their gifts to one another a little bit more unique. What each of them did not anticipate, though, was how unique their gifts to each other would be. Now, Cameron Kennedy decided that since his girlfriend adored Chick-fil-A, eating there about four times a week, he would craft her a bouquet, not of flowers, but of chicken nuggets and waffle fries. He explained that he bought a vase with, brought a vase with him to the store, ordered 30 chicken nuggets and two large fries, and at the restaurant, put the gift together over a few hours. His girlfriend, on the other hand, also went the creative bouquet route and crafted a bouquet made out of Reese's candy. One thing is for certain, though, with both of these gifts, it was a very tasty and fattening Valentine's Day for the couple. I love Reese's, and I love Chick-fil-A, so I would have been happy either way. I talk about DIY there, you know, getting creative, I like it. Yeah, I like both of those. I don't know about four times a week, though. Chick-fil-A, four times a week. <laughs> I could do it. That might have been too much for me. Switch but... it up between the, the grilled and the regular. But... Maybe. Maybe. All right, uh, okay. Mitch, what do you have for us today? Well, Ryan, Marshawn Lynch, one of the best NFL running backs in recent history, called it quits earlier this month at the age of just 29. On its own, I would think nothing of the decision. Just a player who has grown tired of the game and its wear and tear on the body and wants to move on. However, Lynch is not alone. Recently, the New England Patriots linebacker Gerard Mayo, also 29, announced his retirement. This after rumors that Detroit Lions receiver Calvin Johnson may also hang up the cleats at the age of 30. And these aren't just your average everyday players. These are some of the best players at their positions in the game. Two of them, Lynch and Mayo, have even won a Super Bowl. The early retirement of NFL players has become a trend, and one that certainly the NFL has to be aware of. The list of players walking away before their 30th birthday has names added to it each and every year. With the recent blockbuster movie Concussion, and now all we know about the brain disease CTE, it seems players are no longer willing to risk the dangers of a prolonged NFL career. Of course, every player's retirement is different, and there are dozens of factors that go into a player's decision to leave the game. But as more and more NFL players learn more and more about what goes on with the human brain, those nagging doubts will begin to grow. And those concerns could turn the decision to walk away from the game, what was a previously difficult one, a whole lot easier. Very interesting. I, I, I have my own kind of opinions on it, but... Uh... We certainly don't have enough time for that, but absolutely. But definitely an interesting discussion that I think uh, America is starting to have, especially with the concussion movie coming out. Yeah, I think it's going to be one we're going to have, uh, you know, going into the future. It'll be interesting to see if it harms the empire that the NFL yeah. has really built, uh, especially around, you know, the joke is that they own the day Sunday. Right. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that plays out. For sure. Yeah. But uh, to finish us off, Mr. McCoy, what do you have for us? Yeah, so I have a lighthearted story here. A cat that has been missing for more than a year in Taunton, England, has been found in a pet food warehouse. They said that the cat was eating sumptuously and had, and had gained plenty of weight. It had been missing for over 14 months, but it did have a chip, a chip in, in it, and so its owner, it was able to be claimed by its owner. And so... Uh, it's kind of a shorter one, but just kind of more lighter. America loves the cat stories. Yeah. I like so, what you, they, it had a chip in it, but they took them 14 months to find it. Even yeah, that's what I thought was odd, too. They said it was well, showing It's not like a tracking, of... tracking device. Okay, it's okay. one of those things you kind of just scan uh, at the top and then okay. it has your information attached yeah. to it. So. The source of all knowledge here. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Right. So, yeah, just kind of a more lighthearted story, so... Well, thank you, Tyler, for joining us today on The Waynesburg Effect. Thank and you as for always, having me. Mitch, thanks for joining My us. My pleasure. And join us next time on The Waynesburg Effect. As always, I'm Ryan Schwertfaker, and we'll see you next time here on The Waynesburg Effect. <laughs>